Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Sanjot Mahindale. Um, I serve as the chair of the Tang Center for Silk Road Studies, TCSRS for short. Um, as an organized research unit on campus, our mission uh, is not only to expand interest in Silk Road Studies through international conferences, workshops, and other events, but also to support hands-on research opportunities for our faculty and students at museums and in the field. Uh, today's lecture is, I hope, um, the first of many that will highlight some of the multidisciplinary TCSRS-supported research conducted by our very talented doctoral students. Uh, to introduce today's talk, I have asked two people to do the honors. Uh, Patricia Pat Berger, Professor Emeritus of Chinese Art, TCSRS Executive Committee Member, and John Soriano's Primary Advisor, will provide a bit of background to John and his doctoral research. As many of you know, Pat Berger has a long, has long-standing interest uh, in Central Asia and Silk Road Studies, having been among the first of a group of scholars um, to be given access, foreign group of scholars, to be given access to Dunhuang in the late uh, 1970s. In fact, only a year ago we were at Dunhuang, uh, 2018, and we celebrated the 40th anniversary of Pat's first visit uh, to uh, the temple site. Uh, over the years, uh, she has guided a very exceptional crop of students who now, as young faculty, are continuing attention to the art of East Asia and Western China in particular. Uh, but first, I've asked Karen Clancy to say a few words about that, the Dallin and Karen Leon Clancy Fellowship Fund, which supported John's fieldwork this academic year. Um, I like to refer to Karen as the beating heart of the TCSRS, uh, serving as its uh, Director of Development she brings incredible energy to the program. Um, she is a Cal bear through and through, having graduated from Cal, she and her husband, and serving as a UC regent among others. Uh, and she has dedicated her life to fostering educational opportunities. Um, I can give you one example uh, out of dozens uh, I could easily mention. Uh, she has designed and executed four successful Fulbright Hayes Summer Institutes on China for middle and high school teachers. In fact, this week, uh, she has been working nonstop uh, up until actually this lecture uh, on a fifth proposal that, if successful, um, will take a group of 12 teachers uh, to South Korea, Mongolia, and China in 2020. Uh, it should come as no surprise then that she would take the lead in ensuring the center's attention uh, to fostering the next generation of scholars with an interest in Silk Road studies as well. So first, please help me welcome Karen to say a few words about the fellowship. Thank you, Sajat. Um, I have to say that Sajat is, and also uh, Pat Berger, are really my inspiration. Um, I attended a workshop in this very room with Susan Whitfield learning about the Silk Road and the International Dunhuang Project and all of the work that is still yet to be done. And I came back to, um, to the campus and to IAS and I said, well, why isn't Berkeley doing something about the Silk Road? And they said, well, San John's been trying to get an initiative going for the last 10 years. <laughs> and so, so we, um, we went around and, and talked to some different people and, um, and luckily we were able, I think the time was right, we were able to gather um, through the generosity of the, the Tung family, um, Oscar and Agnes, and then uh, the three siblings, uh, Leslie Nadine and her brother Martin to um, start the Silk Road Center. And so with the start of the center, then one of the things that my husband, who's sitting in the back, um, uh, and I talked about was how do we make sure that, um, that the research that's going on will continue? How do we get more people interested so that we can do what um, Susan Whitfield and what um, Pat Berger said about how do we get more students interested 
in studying this vast area that has so much more research to be done. And um, so we actually started uh, the Leon Clancy uh, Fellowship at the Silk Road Center. And um, so John Soriano is our very first inaugural scholar. So he was with us in Dunhuang last summer. Um, we're very excited that, uh, that he's able to give a talk and uh, to start our program off because we think that hopefully there are some of you graduate students out here who will consider applying for um, one of the fellowships that we have because we hope to do something um, every year. Uh, the other thing I wanted to give a plug on since we're talking about scholarships is we talked um, IAS into joining the Big Give campaign. And so if you go to our website, iasberkeley.edu, uh, later tonight and um, all day tomorrow, you can give any size donation, um, $5 to $5 million, <laughs> whatever you would like to give to us. And, um, and the amount will go to student scholarships. And so you can specifically say um, if you want it to go to one of the IAS centers, um, the Tang Center is one of them, um, or you can choose to say that you want them to go to IAS and then we'll divide all of the money among all of the centers. But this is to go for student scholarships. So for um, the research that, that all of our grad students are doing, I know they all need um, some support. And so it's specifically to help them with doing um, some of their research related to travel and um, some of the things that, that John's been able to do and hopefully some of our other grad students will be able to do. So, uh, so please, please, if you could go to uh, participate in the Big Give, just go to our uh, IAS website, click on the button and uh, any amount you can do it online um, and we would really appreciate it because um, I think the university is looking at not only the amounts of money that come in, but also the numbers of people who are willing to support a program, and that helps us tremendously. So thank you very much. First, I wanted to uh, just thank Karen Clancy and Dallin Clancy for this incredible gift to the university. I, it just means so much to have pockets of money available for students to do the field work that they need to do to take quick trips, as John did very recently, into the area where he's um, been focusing his research and to um, come back with important information to further his dissertation project. And it also enables me to have the pleasure to stand here and introduce uh, John Soriano to you, and I think most of you already know him, so it's a bit redundant, but uh, just to say that John is a very advanced graduate student in the Department of History of Art, whom I've had the pleasure of working with now for how many years, John? It's been... About seven, seven years. So. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, seven. So um, that means he's all but dissertation at this point. And so this event actually is an encouragement uh, for him to get some of the ideas out that um, he will be putting out in his dissertation. And again, um, based on field work that he was able to do because of the fellowship he received from the Clancy Fund. So this is a wonderful thing. Um, John uh, actually came to Berkeley with two master's degrees from Taiwan. And um, his inc very impressive master's thesis written in Chinese, which I struggled through. But it was marvelous um, introduction to his thinking. And I was very happy to welcome him into a program where I was hoping more and more to have people who were specializing in things having to do with Central Asia. So that's been wonderful. And in the meantime, John has now been thinking about the dissertation for quite some time, and I think is now coming to the place where he can actually write a solid outline. So this is a very important first step. Um, and it has very much to do with John's interest in a tantric system of the Kala Chakra, the Wheel of Time, uh, on the one hand. And secondly, on an issue that's very formalist, actually, from the art historical point of view, and that has to do with issues of precision in uh, the way things are created in uh, the artistic sphere and also in measurement, because that's a very important part of that whole un undertaking. So now, as a result of this incredible research that he's done, um, this last trip that he took, actually the last two trips, uh, into Gansu and Qinghai provinces, uh, he has come back with some new material, some new ways of thinking about things. And um, I hope this is really wonderful to see this as it begins to uh, take shape at this point. I also wanted to commend John publicly for the beautiful opening slide he's given us here. I think if worse comes to worst, or even you know, as a sideline, you should definitely be a graphic artist. <laughs> so John, please step up and let us hear what you've been up to.
Well, you don't need um, thank you, uh, Pat, very much for your introduction. I'm, I'm still kind of uh, nervous. I, I've never been introduced my, by my advisor before. And also thank you, Sanja and um, Karen, for um, uh, introducing me as well. Um, I'll just get started. This, is, uh, this next image is a photo of a book that was on display in the studio of a person named uh, Zhao Ba Jia, a somewhat renowned monk painter from Repgong. Uh, a city in the Huangnan Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture of Qinghai Province, China. He had it on display with a number of other items. Um, there he is in the back, like precious minerals, uh, this gifted calligraphic work with the name of the Buddha, and other sacred objects and other things to be bought. Um, each object could fall within distinct categories of Buddhist art. There were sketches and icons, Chinese and Tibetan, but they're all brought together in this person's uh, studio in this very interesting way. Um, the image itself, I'm not going to dwell too long on this image, but just the where of the, the guidebook. Uh, this is a guidebook that monks uh, and painters use to draw icons of Buddhist images in, on Tonka paintings and on um, monastery walls. Uh, this kind of where revealed uh, an often overlooked relationship between, say, iconicity and iconometry um, and uh, the function of an image versus uh, its, its form and its display. Uh, my talk today is an attempt to really think about these terms. Um, and uh, one thing in particular that I wanted to focus on for my talk today um, was something I've been thinking about as a graduate student, uh, as Pat introduced. Uh, I've been a graduate student for a number of years now. And I've uh, really gotten accustomed to uh, institutional categorization of Buddhist art, on the one hand, around sociolinguistic entities and uh, that more or less coincide with larger ethnic and national configurations, and on the, on the other hand, with the, in a kind of uh, teleology that situates the art between some indigenous tradition and modernity. Um, all of which is to suggest, uh, all of which suggests that Buddhist art operates as a kind of intermediate, necessary middle age. So that, for instance, uh, despite the cosmopolitanism of art produced in the Yuan Dynasty, uh, these historical configurations are eventually encompassed by, uh, like this thing would be encompassed by this frame of Chinese Buddhist art. Uh, and I, I'm just prefacing that because I just want to, again, thank the uh, Dunhuang, uh, uh, the Sen Tang Center for Sil Silk Road Studies, the Dunhuang Foundation, the Dunhuang Institute, uh, and especially Karen and Dowling uh, Clancy for giving mis me this opportunity to th think beyond these terms of nas uh, nationality, um, iconicity, and iconometry. Um, and that's what I'm going to try to do in this talk today. But, uh, of course, having said all this, my talk remains structured around a single region of China, uh, this region right here, mostly contiguous with two contemporary territorial units uh, within the PRC, that's Gansu and Qinghai provinces. Gansu is the long one. Um, from, uh, and uh, my talk will concern this area from around the 4th century to the 18th, which is a really much too long a period of time. Um, here's a more detailed map uh, that I uh, have been using, and I'll be re referring to this map regularly, uh, with sites that I've visited and others that I haven't, but that will play, that will play into my talk. Uh, just generally speaking, the red and yellow sites are ones that I've visited, the blue ones are ones that I've not. So the first, for, for the first part of my talk, or uh, first of all, I'd like to note that my talk attempts to situate Buddhist art uh, in Gansu and Qinghai within and in relation to the larger world of Buddhist art. Uh, second, attempting to, it attempts to identify a distinct visual mode within this region that does not preclude relevance of such a visual mode elsewhere. That means I'm talking about one strain of Buddhist art, maybe strain isn't the best word, but one type of Buddhist art in the region that probably works in other places as well. Uh, indeed, something analogous was probably happening elsewhere and most likely in South Asia. Uh, third, by claiming this visual mode within Buddhist art, I'm not making any kind of claim as to this visual mode defining Buddhist art as a whole. I'm just talking about one particular type of Buddhist art. Uh, in slightly more concrete terms, I'm saying that within so-called Buddhist art, there is a multiplicity of things and ways of seeing them. Yet art in this region contains at least one subset of things, uh, the forms of which are determined by a tendency towards calculation and cosmography. And that's where I get my title from. Uh, by using the term 
cosmography, I'm referring to the centrality of a vision, uh, uh, centrality of a vision, and depiction and making sense of the fundamental constituents of the Buddhist cosmos, time and space. Uh, there is furthermore a tendency in Buddhist art to depict these phenomena by means of quantification and calculation. Uh, as, might, as might already be inferred from what I've said so far, one of the larger claims in asserting a visual continuity in this region is to link a seeming divide. On the one side, there is an earlier period typified by the caves around Dunhuang. Oops. Sorry. Sorry. Here's Dunhuang. Uh, and other site, major site-based agglomerations of Buddhist art along the, the Silk Road, uh, such as uh, Bingling Si and uh, Mai Ji Shan. Um, uh, sites which are conventionally studied within the frame of Chinese Buddhism. Uh, on the other side, there are the religious centers of Amdo, the ter traditional ter uh, Tibetan territorial name for a ge geographical unit roughly contiguous with Gansu and Ch Qinghai provinces. Uh, and here are the, some of these sites that I visited in this region. Um, asserting a continuity between these two sides is thus a proposal for a larger Buddhist art history. Um, or at least I'm calling it Buddhist art history because uh, the, that terminology is convenient. Uh, I'm, I'm still not sure myself of how rigorous the support and evidence is for such a claim of continuity, so I'd appreciate feedback on whether this line of thought is convincing. Um, at this point, I'll discuss my theoretical apparatus a bit to clarify some terminology and to be more transparent about what I'm doing before moving on to my main examples, um, which are the Bingling Caves, Dunhuang Cave 257, Tendik Monastery, and uh, Shachung Monastery and a few others. Uh, as the larger motivation for this talk is thus to explore the possible connections between two seemingly categorically disparate art historical um, fields in a single region, I didn't want to start with a grand theory or concept that the sites could serve as evidence for. Uh, but rather to proceed inductively from examination of these disparate sites, then look around for potential ways to conceptualize this disparity, noting what seems to fit. So in addition to archival research, it was vital that I conduct field work to get a stronger sense of the region and its sites. Uh, briefly, I did field work for several months in 2017, 2017 and 2018 in Gansu and Qinghai, and most recently in uh, Inner Mongolia, but also um, Beijing. Uh, in my attempts to concatenate my field research, it turned out that the most resident theoretical work uh, is from George Kubler, particularly the 1962 Shape of Time. Though this work seems anachronistic for art history now, since the initial text was published in 1962, um, with clarifications in 1979 and 1982, certain concepts and methodological orientations from the work remain useful. Uh, the work is probably most well remembered uh, for its valorization of artifacts that fit within the model of a prime object, a historical artifact that is the first of its kind to solve a specific problem and is thus replicated. However, other aspects of Kubler's system are more useful. Uh, for me at least. Indeed, it is probably impossible to identify prime objects in Buddhist art as what survives today is only a small percentage of what was produced during historical moments of Buddhist flourishing. And furthermore, such objects are likely unrepresentative of what was actually there. It makes more sense to identify extant Buddhist art as inherently replicative. Uh, beyond the uh, beyond the dis distinction uh, between prime object and replica, uh, Kubler po posits that the work of art history uh, posits the work of art history to be the formation of certain shapes uh, that, in a way, transcend teleological narratives of historical development, and secondly, uh, they tr transcend categorization according to style. Um, and styles are, for Kubler, necessarily ossifying and prescriptive. Uh, Kubler's shape, uh, his term is uh, use of the, the word shape is a collection of objects that are morphologically individuated replicas of each other and that they all respond to the same problem. So this uh, issue of problem is key. Such objects, uh, such object replicas form a sequence in a mathematical sense and Kubler also uses the term relay in the electromagnetic sense uh, in that each replica appears instantiated at a discrete chronological time and place. Uh, a sequence is distinct from a series in that it is open to further iterations, and it's all very helpful in thinking about what's coming into Buddhist art and what we uh, discover. Um, there are formal, uh, some formal parameters to, to uh, what 
he describes this form. There are six formal parameters, but I'm not going to get into that at the moment. Um, the object's formal parameters, uh, importantly, are a response to their re unique problem. And certainly, objects can simultaneously respond to a range of problems. A formal sequence of known objects taken together thus forms a distinct shape, and this concept will um, um, be important uh, as we move along, from which to conceptualize a kind of time. That is, the shape, of, uh, the shape of a sequence constitutes the shape of time. A formal sequence is time, one kind of time among others. More specifically, uh, Kubler's system of various sequences conceptualizes a particular kind of sequence he calls an intermittent class, in which a sequence of objects is disconnected from a subsequent continuation of the same sequence. I don't, I'm not sure if, that, that, uh, if you're still following me, but we, we have a set of objects from an earlier period and a set of objects from a later period, and Kubler works to bridge these together. Uh, in addition to certain other benefits from Kubler's uh, system, such as its critique on the unnecessary severing of meaning from form, uh, replication regardless of an imagined aura of an, of an original, um, and its gra uh, Kubler's grounding in art historical and archaeological data, the main thing Kubler allows is that the uh, concept of an intermittent class seems to work for connecting the calculative and cosmographical tendencies in Buddhist art of differential historical periods and sociolinguistic groups. Um, so essentially, I propose that a sequence is constituted by a Buddhist need for calculated and cosmographic reorientation in visual form. Uh, essentially, a sensorial grounding based on the real nature of the cosmos. Um, further, this sensorial grounding is not necessarily bound to text and doctrine, and I'll talk about that in a moment. There is a need for cosmography, an image of the cosmos. In Kublerian terms, the question that this art answers is, how can the phenomenal world better reflect what it is to be Buddhist? Despite this assertion, uh, disparities between objects loom large. Um, identifying a continuity in the mode of vision at this relatively early moment in my research um, and attempting to synthesize and connect, concatenate what appear to be rather great uh, disparities among the range of Buddhist objects um, is still an open question. Uh, one major issue is that on the one hand, early sites such as Bingling, Dunhuang, Yungang, and other proximate Buddhist cave and rock shrine complexes that, fur uh, that flourished from the 4th to 13th centuries become somewhat obsolete with the adaptations of the Silk Road and the Ming Dynasty. Uh, on the other hand, uh, monastic halls and other religious architecture in subsequent periods um, are distinct in very important ways, such as their geography, their environment, their architecture, uh, their religious function to a certain extent, in addition to the economic, political, and other social interests. However, all these sites offer Buddhist interior spaces that are starkly differentiated from the environment outside. I hope to show that these interiorized spatial constructions likewise provide a matrix for Buddhist becoming. And I'm not sticking to that terminology, but there's something happening inside that isn't happening outside of the sites. Uh, there is thus a possibility for continuity between the depiction of astronomical mathematical tendencies that uh, Pat was just talking about, that uh, um, are become important for the later parts of my dissertation, um, and the earlier art history of the region. The earlier sites may provide the basis from which to understand later de developments in depiction. That's uh, saying a lot. To begin, I want to start with the formal uh, sequence by focusing on early depictions of the Thousand Buddha motif and how it grounds Buddhist space. The Thousand Buddha motif is unquestionably ubiquitous among a range of Buddhist sites, many of which are familiar to scholars of Buddhism. Um, some of you might recognize this image here. In its early visual formation, we see a quickly developing formal series among sites on the Eastern extension of the eastern extension of the overland Silk Road, extend, extending from the Gansu Corridor, surviving primarily in cave sites around Dunhuang, Binglingse, and other sites. Uh, present in several texts, the motif lacks an originary schematic representational program that organizes or models uh, uh, material or visual form, so that its historical development is relatively independently visual. Um, Oops. Skipping around. 
The Thousand Buddha motif is not only one of the most repeated visual configurations found in Buddhist sites throughout Inner and East Asia, the name itself is one of the most common ways of referring to cave sites uh, in at least uh, one language and thus becomes a conventional means of understanding what the cave sites are. The name is so pervasive that the caves of the Thousand Buddhas or Chen Fu Dong has historically and often uncriti uncritically been used to denote any site Based, uh, any site-based grouping of Buddhist devotional caves and shrines, regardless of their connection to any specific program of Thousand Buddhas mentioned in scriptures. At Dunhuang, there are distinct sites named the Western Thousand Buddha Caves. Um, and here's an arrow pointing to uh, these caves. The um, red dot to the right of the um, dot on the left is uh, the Mogao site, which is the most well-known for, for Buddhism. But there are also um, Buddhist Thousand Buddha Caves um, to, to the right of it, I mean to the, the east of it, east and west of it. The term th Caves of the Thousand Buddhas is often specifically used to describe the Mogao Caves, uh, uh, Mogao Ku themselves, the most prominent of the Dunhuang Cave collections. Um, despite appearing indistinguishable from many of the painted caves and shrines in the region, this image is useful in discussing the motif generally because it highlights many of the morphological features that mark other variant deployments of the form, both in Dunhuang and elsewhere. There is a highly standardized repetition of a common figure whose size, shape, contour, and modeling are mostly identical. Um, save for minute discrepancies in brush stroke that characterize the hand of the copyist. Uh, each figure's seated lotus posture and halo impart a shared level of re religious attainment with many Buddhist, uh, shared level of religious attainment with many Buddhist figures, uh, portraits, and art icons. Especially helpful in recognizing the motif is the anonymity of the figures. More than a thousand years of oxidation and wear have transformed the gilding and luster of their flesh to starkly contrasted residues that only hauntingly mark their personality. Pupils are vacated from their eyes. The figures' cartouches suspended from adjacent upper registers are likewise blank. Uh, only elongated ears remain as legible marks, or uh, lakshana, um, these xiang, uh, to indicate the figures' uh, attainment of Buddhahood. The mural's deterioration, deterioration and anonymity reorient the viewer's attention, reducing much of the array's once dazzling spectacle to its more basic and underlying feature, severe mathematical regularity and patternization, which define the whole of the uh, depicted composition. While the earthy hues of the, this painting are bound to a style found throughout the Mogao caves and shrines, the functional distribution of this limited set of colors suggests that beyond decoration, these figures are not a repeated form of a single normative Buddha, but are instead a range of Buddhas, eight specific figures repeated in horizontal rows, each with their own individuated mode of dress and framing aura. While currently unidentifiable, the eight figures might allude to the seven Buddhas of the past, maybe, uh, albeit repeated many times. On each subsequent row, the sets of eight are shifted horizontally by a length of one figure. Such a composition not only exacts a quality of coordinated precision in its arrangement, but also creates, a clear, uh, also creates clear diagonal patterns across the overall surface of the plane. The subsumption of figural individuality to such overt patternization is very intentional. Uh, and it points to a consciously constructed relationship between the arrangement of the motif and its environmental setting. Anyone who perceives the figures is systematically compelled neither to see the multitude of figures as each representing a, a distinct individual, nor to see them as homogene uh, homogeneous and singular, uh, or nor to see them as a homogeneous and singular mass. Rather, they are viewed in their simultaneous quantifiable multiplicity. That is, the patternization of the set of eight units forces viewers to intuit beyond the individual characteristics and qualia of the depicted forms and towards the more generalizing and abstract notions of quantity and numeration. Moreover, the extension of the motif seems to induce a numerical sublimity that does not necessarily correspond to a mathematical concept of infinity, but to a vast quantity, nevertheless incomprehensible to mundane thought and somewhere beyond ordinary human sense perceptions. This quantified vision grounds a new type of orientation to space and time. Uh, 
In save in which this iteration of the motif appears, the overwhelming visual presence of the form determines the program of the cave as a whole. Essentially, the patternized repeating surface, when understood in relation to the cave interior, uh, presents the viewer with a programmatic method to transcend mundane vision. That is, the quantified multiplicity of the Thousand Buddha motif present, presents a differential view of the world, reconfiguring the subject's perception of time and space by enabling the visual perception of a differential cosmos. This differential cosmography, in turn, will serve as a kind of ground from which instantiations of other forms uh, and denser visual and iconographic programs can arise. Um, I will go over this argument again in more detail, um, but first I want to talk a little bit about textual evidence in relation to visual evidence. At this point, it's important to make a case for how the visual and represented representational processes manifest in the Thousand Buddha, Buddha motif distinguish themselves from textual and doctrinal practices. The historian, uh, the historian of Chinese art, Max Ler, uh, asserted many years ago, the image and its religious meaning may be in harmony or they may not be. The, uh, while the more general sentiment of this quote regarding the complicated relationship between text and image has a certain logic familiar in the discipline of art history, it yet appears insufficient in recognizing the inherently religious quality of Buddhist images regardless of the matter of their depiction, given their function within Buddhist ritual practices. Uh, work from scholars such as Stanley Abe, Bob Scharf, Michelle C. Wong, and others in their discussions selectively regarding or denying the possible uh, ritual functions of Buddhist images have built a sustained discourse regarding the centrality of ritual function as an object of scholarly research into relevant sites. The centrality of ritual has thus become a way to push iconographical and archaeological studies towards a more accurate understanding of the cave art's social function. The voluminous work of scholars from the People's Republic of China, such as Duan Wenjie, Fan Jinshi, uh, Peng Jinjiang, uh, and the work of the Dunhuang Academy, uh, laying the groundwork for the cave document documentation, as well as the complex uh, critical contextualizing art histories of the caves and discussions by Eugene Wang, Wu Hong, and uh, many others, and of course uh, more recent work on the bu uh, on multiple multiple Buddhas and um, other relevant topics by say uh, Xuan Manchen and uh, Marilyn Re, are to be folded into a necessary purposiveness of uh, social ritual function. Uh, for those inclined towards interpreting relevant sites in regards to their religiosity, the purpose of such sites is to perform rituals to perpetuate soteriological and other doctrinal beliefs necessarily outlined in Buddhist scriptures and other relevant texts. Uh, all of these religious analyses also attempt to move away from modernist interpretations of Buddhist sites in terms of their art. That is, art specifically as a field of objects inseparably determined by modernist tastes and sentiment, sentiments, and thus likewise incapable of accounting for the historical conditions of cave production and use, many hundreds of years removed from such sensibilities. Moreover, such a focus on ritual has been somewhat limiting uh, given the lack of direct evidence for ritual processes in the early period beyond offered, often scattered and incomplete textual descriptions that cannot encompass the perceptual fullness of human interaction uh, within, the, within the relevant sites, especially given the limits of text-based evidence in accounting for the embodied sensate activity demanded by ritual practices themselves. Uh, as an alternative, the work of Sarah Fraser, among others, has been valuable in positioning Mogao cave paintings more pointedly within the discipline of art historical methods, while maintaining an appreciation of historical precision and cultural locality. My point is, while ritual may determine a baseline of whether an image is religious or not, images may be able to exceed scripture. Uh, their instrument uh, may, may be able to exceed their instrument, uh, instrumentalization within ritual and perhaps even their mere visibility. Uh, to amend Lur's earlier quote, the image and its scriptural context may be in harmony or they may not be. The possibility that visual phenomena can be of significance to the religion of Buddhism outside of specific ritual context is further corroborated by an often quoted passage from the purported founder of the Dunhuang Mogao Grotto site as a whole, a monk named Le Zun. Um, paraphrasing from a Tang Dynasty stele regarding the founding of the site, and that's the stele that I have here, um, the founder Le Zun suddenly perceived a golden brightness in which appeared the thousand Buddhas and thus remarkably he established a scaffolding and created a cave shrine. I think this is an important quote. 
If we take this historical account as having at least some basis in reality, the initial construction of the Dunhuang Mogao caves was expi explicitly not due to any formalized ritual act, nor was its construction due to any fidelity to scripture. Of paramount importance was a miraculous vision. Uh, and the first Mogao cave was presumably intended to be a depiction of this revelatory moment at a certain remove from scriptural and ritual institutions. Uh, notably, there is a parallel between this, the account of this story and the condition of polyopia, uh, which is a medical condition in which someone gets a type of brain trauma, called, uh, you get an occipital lesion, and subsequently the person sees a, an organized array of uh, single repeated form that isn't actually present uh, in reality. Uh, of course, there is some medical uh, literature on the subject, and I'm not going to talk about it right now. Um, in other words, Ludzun has made an attempt to survive on his own in a sparsely populated rocky desert wilderness, and this experience might have involved some brain trauma. I don't know if anybody's been to Dunhuang, but it is uh, kind of uh, rough. The last claim may be a bit conjectural about brain trauma, but a, a more general point is that an actual visual condition can provide a model for the specific depiction of the thousand Buddhas, whereas the exact form of the depicted motif does not appear, appear to have a correlate in scripture, at least uh, I'm aware of a contemporary scripture with uh, such a correlate. Of course, the thousand Buddhas appear with great frequency in Mahayana uh, scriptural literature, as do other more or less specific numerations of Buddhas. Taking for granted the veracity of the 366 date given on the, steely, on the steely does, however, help to isolate possible sources from which the vision of the thousand Buddhas was adapted for uh, depiction. 366 is very early. Early enough to have uh, most likely been before the earliest tra Chinese translations of the Gandavyuha and its contextual Avatamsaka Sutra, uh, the Huayanjing flower ornament scripture um, by a person named Fo Tuo Ba Tuo Luo um, in the uh, fourth century. Uh, a seemingly more important source of relevant texts comes from the transla translation work of Dharma Raksha, who was from Dunhuang and was active in the later third century. Dharma Raksha's Chinese name is uh, Zhu Fa Hu, uh, but he is identified in his biographies as uh, Yue Zhe, maybe translates into Kushan. Um, so, uh, Zhu Fa, who is the earliest translator of the Lotus Sutra, completed in 286, not translated again until Kumara Jiva in the 400s, uh, Kumara Jiva Jomaloshi. Um, while the Lotus Sutra mentions an otherwise indescript trichiliacosm or san chen uh, da chen fu uh, of Buddhas gathered in the context of a floating double throne stupa, a more directly relevant text is the Bhadra Kalpika Sutra, which Zhu Fa Hu translates into the Xian Jie Jing, or the uh, scripture of the good eon. Uh, and the term eon will become more important. This text has extensive, uh, this text has extensive uh, sections dedicated to the names and biographies of their uh, more precisely 1,052 Buddhas, which are named the thousand Buddhas in the text. Uh, here's a relevant section of the text. This is a very Buddhist quote, and, uh, but a main point uh, that one can take from this very Buddhist um, quote is that even in this relatively comprehensive text, there is not much of a program explaining how to visualize the thousand Buddhas. Rather, what is emphasized is name, recitation, and sound. Uh, though uh, Soper notes that a subsequent commentarial text uh, states drawing the Buddhas has a similar effect, but that text isn't until much later. Um, the literary record shows that discourse on image programs becomes more and more precise with written descriptions of visual and architectural representation appearing in Chinese in the Tang Dynasty with authors such as Dao Xuan. Uh, and they become more precise in esoteric Buddhist scriptures and um, that's kind of where I'm going with this. Uh, in any case, it seems that the, by the time Ludzun is, uh, Ludzun is envisioning the thousand Buddhas and their probable depictions in caves, there is room for synesthetic creativity. And this is what we see in the visual uh, record. Shifting to visual evidence of the early series, we can start by tracking the development of the thousand Buddha motif at sites prior to the Sui and Tang dynasties, uh, prior to 581. In particular, Mogao Cave 257 exemplifies an art historical juncture in which potentially er earlier iterations of the Thousand Buddha motif present less rigidly systematized assemblages of stylistically varied Buddhas. There's 257. Thus far, the earliest iteration. Uh, it's 257. 
I have a map somewhere. So thus far, the earliest uh, iteration of this earlier form, um, the early, earliest uh, moment in the sequence, is Bingling Cave 169. Uh, that's the red uh, dot with the giant arrow on it, uh, which has an inscription uh, dated to 420, the first year of uh, Jin Hong in the Western Qin Dynasty. Um, in a recent work, Mar Marilyn Re dates the Thousand Buddha Wall to before that year. Uh, here's Bingling Cave 169. Um, I wasn't actually given access to that part of the site. There's like a creaky staircase that I think Pat has been on, but um, uh, they, they really just didn't let me in. Um, but I did go to the site. Uh, this dating, um, Marilyn, Marilyn Re dates the Thousand Buddha Wall that we see here. Um, <coughs> with its thousand Buddhas, um, to a prior to 420, uh, 420 of the Common Era. This dating makes sense as we can interpret a gradual accretion of Buddhas at different times without a, a strict sense of a single initial plan for the overall surface uh, of the wall. Uh, and it's probably easiest to recognize, say, morphological distinction between the lower Buddhas and the middle range of Buddhas and perhaps the upper Buddhas in terms of, say, color and, and the size of the Buddhas themselves. Uh, while not in the immediate vicinity of the Gansu corridor, we can also see distinct instantiations of this formal sequence in the hyper-architectural niche constructions of the Thousand Buddhas in the relief card Yungang Caves, um, following imperial patronage in the 460s, Yungang's way over there. Art historian James Caswell makes a stylistic analysis of the Thousand Buddha motif at, the early, uh, at early Yungang Caves uh, 16 to 20 and asserts two different formal groupings um, consisting of a change from a more pronounced Gandharan derived style to a more programmatic one. Here's a, an image of the uh, more relevant uh, earlier Gandharan style. Uh, one might note that while Cas Caswell's stylistic distinction appears validated at the site, his attempts at scriptural interpretations have been uh, criticized. And I'll just um, kind of briefly say that um, there's a lot of Chinese uh, language scholarship in this area that uh, probably supersedes what Caswell wrote. Um, especially maybe the work of uh, Liang Xiaopeng and others. Dunhuang and Bingling are distinct from sites like Yungang or Longmen in their proximity to scholarship, uh, to, uh, in their proximity to sponsorship from their capitals. So um, here we see these two dots on the one on the far right and one on the um, far, uh, the one on the upper far right and one on the lower far right. Those are um, Yungang and Longmen, which are close to the, these uh, capital cities. Um, and sorry. Yeah, and these, uh, these two sites are situated just outside the me metropolitan uh, political cosmological centers. And by cosmological center, I mean political sites configured as centers of the cosmos, uh, such as uh, Ping Chang, Ping Chang, which is, uh, Ping Chang, which is uh, close to Yungang, and Luoyang, which is close to Longmen. And we just saw, and there's a lot of names, we just saw the Yungang caves. Um, and these sites are uh, really marked by a ruler, often understood as the central node connecting heaven and earth in the uh, Chinese fashion. Uh, Dunhuang and Bingling's relative isolation seems to uh, seems perhaps to ground their cave constructions as necessitating necess necessitating more of a need for something like an autonomous center without the need for a central presence of an emperor. Uh, likewise, jumping further afield to the Ajanta caves. Um, what is Ajanta? I think I reversed. Did I not put a map in here? The Ajanta caves are way over here where my hand is. <laughs> um, Jumping uh, to a field to the Ajanta caves, one that gets the impression of Ca uh, Caswell's schematic uh, tendency and of his uh, later period, though also evident is the compromise with depictive layering and depth through the placement of the upper parts of the lower figures as slightly covering the bases of the figures above. And we can see the, the overlap of the Buddha's uh, heads over the laps of the other Buddhas. Uh, moreover, th each of the figures are individu individuated by their hand mudras. Um, Walter Spink's analysis has indicated their illustration uh, to the year 478. Notably, Spink characterizes the, uh, quote, myriad Buddhas motif as essentially intrusive in that it was a territorial claim on cave space by a new set of patrons over an otherwise unfinished Buddhist narrative program. 
and I won't go into that too closely. Okay, back to Cave 257. Uh, 257 was constructed and painted in the Northern Way at some point between the years 368 and 535. Um, while most likely not Ludzun's cave, 257 has the distinction of being, first of all, one of the earliest Mogao caves in which the Thousand Buddha motif is dominant. The motif's importance is clear since for any, almost any horizontal span of the walls, the Thousand Buddhas occupy roughly half the surface area and much of the center. Uh, the other parts of the wall are divided into bands with virtualized depictions of narrative scenes such as Jataka tales or figures like the heavenly asparas in architectural niches or the dwellers of, uh, or as dwellers of the underworld. The interrelation of these registers suggests what the overall mural is doing. An upper register of multicolored and thickly contoured block forms is depicted as extending in three-dimensional space from the surface of the wall towards the interior of the cave relative to a standpoint somewhere near the center of the cave. These blocks are presumably an imitation of a real, now lost, architectural feature. The registers immediately above and below these blocks fall in line with its architectural representational program. Moving down, there's the vast uh, Thousand Buddha surface, followed by another register of note immediate below, which uh, depicts the Deer Jataka and the story of Lady Sumati. Despite its size relative to the wall, this narrative band has received most of the scholarly discourse uh, dedicated to this cave, obviously not without reason. Uh, worth noting here is that, like the architectural facade above, this scene also indicates recession space, so that despite its lack of uh, the more obvious representational effects in the manner of the blocks above, the mere assertion of a landscape, uh, landscape requires that the viewer, in a sense, push through the surface of the wall to perceive, in this instance, figures seated uh, within houses or a deer ensconced among natural landforms, which are probably mountains. The Thousand Buddha motif starkly breaks with the visual mode of both these surrounding reliefs by presenting a flat plane with figures seated on mats, but with figures and mats essentially floating in a void, uh, right, neither in landscape nor in any other locatable environment, but on an abstract line and suspended in, flat, in the flat color red. The size of each Buddha the size of each Buddha is highly controlled and determines an idealized standpoint of a viewer who can only perceive these qualities simultaneously from a given distance. Each individual Buddha must be small enough for the viewer to intuit a great multitude in a single glance. But likewise, each must be, still be recognizable as a Buddha. Thus, each of the replicated Buddhas depicted in the middle register achieves a bare minimum of representational detail that can allow for the viewer's identification of the figures as Buddhas. As this identification is achieved, the effect of sheer, uh, is of sheer quantity. Um, the effect of sheer quantity is achieved by situating the smallest recognizable Buddhas from a given distance. We can see that they're Buddhas, and we can just barely see that they're Buddhas, but we really notice that there's a lot of them. In addition to this compositional principle, the size of the Buddhas is simultaneously determined by the precise numeration of the Bhadrakalpika Sutra. As the number of depicted Buddhas in the motif, um, roughly 900, and there's the math uh, in the lower part of the, uh, the screen, uh, the number of depicted uh, Buddhas in the motif is approximately equal to the 1,052 Buddhas mentioned in the text. Again, recall that the Bhadrakalpika Sutra contains a list of individual names for each of the thousand Buddhas of the current eon, of which there are three. There's past, present, and future. Um, Shakyamuni, is the, Shakyamuni is the fourth, and Maitreya is the fifth Buddha. In reciting the sutra, each name thus accounts for a duration of time, the epoch in which a given Buddha can exist. Each Buddha thus forms the basis upon which a given epoch is centered. Upon completion of the thousand names, the incantator will have, a, will have spanned a thousand epochs, an entire eon or kalpa, from beginning to end. Depicting uh, each of the thousand Buddhas as homogeneous units thus pr provides the beholder uh, with a ritualized understanding of time in some ways analogous to the incantation of Buddha names in the sutra. However, this um, type of depiction is also markedly different from incantation in that the eon is spanned by a, uh, by a synoptic and totalizing vision of deep time. Thus, the thousand Buddha motif with its simultaneous instantiation of an exacting number of Buddhas itself gives a shape to time. Um, 
The shape, this shape is a homogeneous repetition of time grounded on the appearance of the Buddhas. Further, the coordinate plane of Buddhas presents a visual collapsing of the passage of eonic time into a single moment of synoptic vision. With the depiction, vision and space supersede time. A differential space is thus opened up to vision. This is a coordinate space of patternized and regular repetition marked by the presumable shimmering from the once gilded faces of quantitatively arrayed waves of Buddhas. With this visual transformation of time into space, viewers whose orientations had otherwise been caught by virtual architecture or landscape features are now presented with another means of perceiving their cosmos. Merely to perceive such an ocean of Buddhas requires a mode of vision abstracted beyond normal perception, somewhat analogous to the doctrinal concept of an otherwise imperceptible, imperceptible Dharma realm or Dharma Datu that pervades mundane reality. Perhaps it is a direct, uh, perhaps this is a direct illustration of such a Dharma realm. Scriptures such as the Lotus Sutra do assert that certain phenomena are only visible after achieving a suitably advanced level of consciousness. The array is moreover exactingly calculated to align with the Bhadrakalpika, Bhadrakalpika Sutra. Given that the number of Buddhas uh, proximity to 1000 most likely form part of an overall cosmographic program making available to the beholder the fundamental constituents of the cosmos as a whole, what else is left to comprehend? Uh, what happens next? The sense of totality and vastness of the synoptic Buddhas seems to have a nullifying effect so that the severe repetition and regularity equally evoke everything but also nothing, a void. Uh, as such, the motif by itself can be likened to a mathematical coordinate plane without any points or formula graphed onto it. It reverts to a blank matrix upon which other units can assert their presence. The undifferentiated multitude eventually demands some kind of resolution in the form uh, of a figural presence. Earlier, earlier caves such as 257 maintain that somewhere within the, the plane of the thousand Buddhas, um, a single figure must be foregrounded. Visually, the surface requires some unit with which to orient the otherwise directionless, uh, the otherwise um, directionlessness and indeterminacy, indeterminacy of coordinate space. Despite the overwhelming presencing of the span of the thousand Buddhas across the central section of the space, a centralized figure just slightly larger than the surrounding Buddhas uh, appears within each of 257's um, three interior, wall, interior walls, and we just saw that, uh, sorry, necessarily affixed to a ground line that must have offered a more traditional and palpable sense of substance and orientation among the floating waves of Buddhas. Uh, 257, um, 257's evidence. Uh, moving towards a, a normalized overall view of the cave from just inside the entrance reiterates this need for immediate presence. And the thousand Buddhas appear to serve as a matrix or womb from which the central sculptural triad and niche emerge. Is there a triad? No, I don't. See. The central figure emerges. Cave 257 is unique in its privileging of the thousand Buddhas relative to other Buddhist narratives, though there, there are analogs at Dunhuang. Uh, for instance, in uh, one of the western thousand Buddha caves, there is a wide and rounded vestibule that narrows into a more, cent uh, a more traditional central pil pillar cave. Um, oh, here's more images, uh, kind of out of order. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, skip over this part. There is a cave that I was not given access to in the western, I mean, I was not allowed to take pictures of, and that happens a lot in China, in the uh, western Thousand Buddha Caves, but it's essentially more Thousand Buddhas than the cave that we just saw. Uh, it's more completely dedicated to the Thousand Buddhas. Uh, and this is the western Thousand Buddhas, Buddha Cave. Um, and I should also just uh, mention that somebody at the Dunhuang, um, Dunhuang Academy in, in China is working on uh, the methods, actual methods used to depict these uh, Buddhas, uh, like uh, this uh, kind of string used to create um, very, uh, very straight lines and uh, other architectural tools uh, involved. Uh, that person's name is Cheng Bo. Um, it is clear that later caves adapt the space established by the Thousand Buddha surfaces to fit more dense programs of vision. When the Thousand Buddha motif appears in subsequent cave settings, it seems to have established a non-conventional space in which myriad other statues and transformation tableau could ex coexist simultaneously. 
The displacement of the founders and Buddhists from the center becomes more overt in 254, also for the Northern Way. Uh, this cave is a much denser juxtaposition of iconographies and virtualized spaces. For instance, the iteration of the wonderful Tiger Jataka painting that's um, kind of middle, lower left, um, which seems to overlay or push aside the surrounding thousand Buddhas. Uh, here's a close-up of it. However, the west wall of the cave more or less preserves the layout of 257. The subsequent, the subsequent Sui dynasty and the cosmopolitan Tang dynasty coincide with what Kubler calls a fast happening, in which the sequence of relevant objects starts to become more complex and dense uh, with increased production and exchange of forms. Uh, this density is evident on the art itself. For instance, uh, at Dunhuang, the Thousand Buddhas are displaced to zones of less immediate visual importance relative to, um, say, the figures here. Uh, or to these transformation tableaux, as they're called, uh, so that um, the thousand Bud Buddhas are pushed into a kind of heavenly array. Uh, the motif is likely being conflated with the, quote, hundreds, thousands, myriads, and millions of Buddhas floating in the sky, uh, as, uh, end quote, as derived from the Lotus Sutra and its commentaries, which situate the many Buddhas around a stupa with two throne Buddhas. Given such imagery, the myriad Buddha motif can perhaps too easily be interpreted as little more than an, or than an ornamentalized decoration for more spectacular and thus seemingly more art historically important representational vignettes and scenes, whether painted, sculpted, or otherwise. However, contrary to Eugene Wong's claim that the Thousand Buddha motif is often, quote, a visual, a visual synecdoche, a, a mnemonic device that recalls the stupa scene of the Lotus Sutra, end quote, he's claiming it's all Lotus Sutra stuff. The deployment of the Thousand Buddhas provides a Buddhist spatial matrix from which a range of other icons, imagery, and doctrines can be posited. Outside Dunhuang, the Thousand Buddha motif eventually becomes ubiquitous as just uh, such a matrix. Uh, we can see the extent of this form's distribution uh, exemplified by its use on the Tamamushi Shrine in uh, Horyuji uh, in Nara, Japan, um, dated to 747. Here's the interior of the shrine, which um, isn't usually looked at very closely. Uh, suffice to say that monasteries throughout East Asia must have been replicating the motif in hall interiors by the Tang Dynasty. Uh, by this time, the motif is also evident on a variety of stelae, um, and I don't have a picture for that at the moment. Um, at this time, there are also further adaptations of the motif. motif. There's a somewhat related form in the Kizil Thousand Buddha Caves. Um, there's Kizil and there's Dunhuang in the red, orange, and yellow. Uh, though each module presents its own unique illustration of a scene from Buddhist scripture within repeated and patternized units of diamond shape mountain terrain, providing a definite environmental setting that makes it more like a narrative compared to the planar repeated thousand Buddhas that we've been looking at. Returning to another part of Gansu, um, here this uh, arrow uh, with the blue dot is pointing to uh, Tendik Monastery. I didn't actually visit the site, that's why it was blue. Uh, but here we see other people's photographs of the site. Uh, and we see a formalization of the Thousand Buddhas as a standard motif outside of cave interiors, as well as a new method of deploying the motif to reorient the natural landscape. These paintings essentially re-territorialize the established shape of the rock face by adding or revealing a surface layer of Thousand Buddhas, essentially serving a similar function to Cave 257 in their conversion of the natural landscape to reveal its more innate, higher level properties. Uh, Tendik as a site is likewise understood as a sort of incubator for the so-called second dissemination of the Dharma among Tibetan Buddhists. Briefly, following, a, um, just to recount history, following an extensive Buddhist persecution within Tibetan society and the disintegration of the Tibetan Empire, which also coincided uh, with the end of a cent about a century of Tibetan rule in Dunhuang in 8 848, the ninth century ordination of uh, Lachen Gongba Rapsel at Tendik was the, was the single event myth that mythically allowed Buddhism to survive, the uh, to survive their, their persecution and subsequently flourish. One might perhaps categorize some of the Buddhist art from this period in terms of disarray. Nearby Bingling, uh, returning to Bingling, which is very close to Tendik, um, there is a, a smaller shrine. 
here it is, now exposed, which similarly, similarly presents a simultaneity of varied forms, which makes the shrine, uh, the shrine space as a whole difficult to date. I have not found any literature on this shrine, but the tourist sign says it was made in the Tang Dynasty. Um, this might be understandable given the, Bing, the Bingling Shrine's relative similarity to the Tamamushi Shrine in Japan, uh, but the esoteric Buddhist figures like the ones on the back wall um, are generally associated with Tibetan and Nepalese art from after the 10th century. Uh, in addition uh, to a row of repeated Buddhas, uh, probably the thousand Buddhas, there also seems to be a middle register of figures reminiscent of more overtly Chinese paintings. Given this visual disarray, one can make a preliminary hypothesis uh, that such disarray is perceived as a problem. This is an important point. Uh, this problem is sub uh, subsequently gets resolved by a specific form common to esoteric Buddhism and the Tantras, and that form is the mandala, which has as one of its primary formal features an exact positional schema for a set of ver for a set of varying classes of figures. The mandala makes sense of a lot of different kind of crazy uh, uh, figures in one place. Uh, returning to the textual reference of the Thousand Buddhas, we do find them placed in the text of um, something called the Sarva Tathagata Tattva Samgraha, which some people are familiar with as uh, the STTS. Uh, this text is translated into Chinese in 753 by a Moghavadra or Bukong Jingang and translated into Tibetan around the year 1000 by uh, Shradhakara Varman and Rinchen Sang Sangpo. Uh, just for reference, the Bhadrakalpika Sutra gets translated into Tibetan in 755. Uh, in the text of the STTS, the thousand Buddhas are known as Mahasattvas and a grouping of them is said to be positioned on the peripheral edges of the STTS's primary mandala form, the Vajradhatu mandala. The thousand Buddhas are peripheral in relation to a central Vairochana and a retinue of 36 other figures. The text itself is rather sparse and the specific arrangement of the Mahasattvas is clarified in commentaries as well as in painted depictions. It is important to note that one of the principal features of systems of tantras is the array of figures is that the array of figures is, standard, is standardized across both text and image. Here we have a very familiar um, early image of the mandala, the Vajradhatu mandala, which was painted around the year 800. Uh, it is currently at the eastern capital, or Toji, in Kyoto, Japan, but presumably it was painted in the Tang Dynasty capital. The specific part to pay attention to in this very complicated co collection of nine mandalas is the middle mandala and specifically the margin around the middle mandala which features a, t a thousand tiny figures. Um, the thousand Buddhas of the Bhadrakalpa. Um, while their form seems to continue the la uh, while their form seems to continue the layered rows of individuals that we saw in Ajanta, the regularity of colors and circular geometrical forms again suggest a patternization related to the planar, uh, the planar arrays at Dunhuang. Uh, for comparison, another iter iteration of the Vajradhatu mandala appears on the walls of the Alchi Tatsapuri in Ladakh, India, a site that has been carbon dated to the 1200s. There's Alchi. Though this mural, I don't have um, the entire wall, but I do have um, details of the wall. Um, this is probably dated to the 1200s, but this has been retouched uh, since that time. Um, we can see a distinct. Uh, we can see a distinct multitude of figures along the base. A common feature of the mandalic incorporation of the thousand Buddhas is their enfolding into an explicitly geometric and rotationally symmetric planar configuration that supersedes the coordinate planar arrangement that, as we have seen, had up to that point been used as a surface ground to reorient a given space, as we saw in 257. This is a different orientation uh, of the same group. The system of depicting mandalas allows for extensive abbreviation in its compositions. That is to say that many of the figures intended for the ritual do not have to be depicted in visual representation. For example, this cloth painting from Dunhuang, which lacks many of the figures named in the Vajradhatu textual corpus, still features the five core figures that allow its iconography to remain legible. The need for abbreviation is further evidenced by the ceiling of Mogao Cave 465. 
Uh, dated to around 1300, the cave presents the Vajradhatu mandala with Vairachana in the center panel. There's a schematic uh, of the ceiling. And a portion of the remaining mandala figures distributed across the four surrounding trapezoidal, trapezoidal planes. Here's one of the trapezoids, and here's a close-up. The thousand Buddhas have been drastically reduced to, uh, uh, to a few extra figures standing behind the central retinue. So we can clearly uh, mark out the Buddhas from the Bodhisattvas. Though their overlapped arrangement and displacement to the background seems to be a return to the Ajanta mode of de depicting recession, the arrangement is still a large calculated group that stands in for the complete number of the Tantra text. In terms of continuity to earlier caves, we see again that older, more fundament fundamental aggregate forms are pushed up towards the ceiling, while the eye-level surfaces are dedicated to other tantras that must have been more immediately relevant uh, to Buddhist practices in the Yuan Dynasty, such as Chakra Samvara. As is evident, the development of increasingly varied and complex systems of tantra, uh, each with its concomitant mandala and retinue, decreased the need to replicate the expansive form of the Thousand Buddhas motif that we saw in 257. At this point, uh, around the end of the Yuan Dynasty, the sequence of thousand, the Thousand Buddha motif reaches its, uh, what I'm calling the Kublerian intermittence within esoteric Buddhist traditions. Um, is uh, something from the Yuan Dynasty. However, one could argue that it is the specific functional form of the Thousand Buddha motif rather than its iconography that prevails in subsequent esoteric Buddhist art. To summarize its basic elements, this form is constituted by a dense frontal and planar array of repeated and regular Buddhist icons, an array that functions as a synoptic vision of multiple generational intervals. This synopsis thus manifests a space from which more singular iconic presences emerge. While the continuity of the Thousand Buddhas as a spatial array is replicated in Buddha icon halls throughout East Asia, uh, the array understood according to its formal qualities and not necessarily bound to its iconographic scriptural reference, uh, can be identified to a great range of Buddhist, uh, esoteric Buddhist art from the 10th century forward. Returning to Gansu and Qinghai provinces, artistic production at Dunhuang and other cave sites in the region becomes less active with the onset of uh, increased maritime trade, as I mentioned earlier. Instead of caves, Tibetan religious activity in the region causes a significant temple building enterprise in the mountainous regions just south of the desert. Oh, this is, uh, I'm missing a, a map slide here, sorry. Um, there should be a map here, but we, we saw that big mass of, of caves um, just south of Dunhuang, where, where all the mountains are, and that's where I was doing my field work. These monastery and temple sites provide interior spaces that likewise constitute a transformation of the surrounding space. Um, as my dissertation focuses on the rise of the Gelukpa uh, lineage, lineages following the institution of the Ganden uh, Potrang, uh, and the popular conversion of Mongols to that sect in the 1600s, I've isolated just a few of the more than, than 1,000 monasteries in the region for field work um, on the, their forms, and, uh, on the forms of space these interiors make. Um, this is, uh, I just need a drink of water. I mentioned the Ganden uh, Potrang, and this is one of the images that circulated from that point. Uh, one of the um, leaders at the, at the time, uh, Desi San, San, Sanjay Gyamto, um, wrote a manual from which other art artists throughout their realm were intended to copy from. This is um, one of the images from that manual. Um, I also just want to mention that uh, Gray Tuttle at Columbia, and uh, I don't know if Hannibal is here, but, but Hannibal uh, Taubes here at Berkeley were very helpful in uh, helping me to identify a lot of the sites that I went to for my field work. Um, having said that, and actually doing field work, one begins to appreciate the thoroughness with which Buddhist sites in China were extinguished during the mid 20th century. One might think the, uh, of the mid-20th century as another instance of Kublerian intermittence. Nevertheless, sequences of form persist. For example, this is a current photograph of uh, Shachung Monastery deep in the mountains of Qinghai. Uh, Shachung means uh, Garuda, it's a, that 
mythical bird, and this name makes immediate sense. Uh, uh, this name makes immediate sense given the monastery's location on the peaks of a mountain range. The monastery was first established in 1349 and is significant as the ordination site of uh, Tonkapa, the founder of the Gelugpa, uh, Gelugpa sect or um, religion. The monastery was actually a uh, Gadampa uh, monastery and was not incorporated into Gelugpa until 1599, then completely annihilated in the 1950s. But reconstruction in the 1980s was largely, largely based on a single monk who remembered the monastery as a child. Uh, we can thus understand the current monastery as a formal replica of the earlier site. Chachung Monastery is relatively unique among monasteries because its size enables monastic specialization into uh, these things called dratang. Uh, it's dratang here, this isn't Chachung though. Um, sorry. Uh, the term Dratang is uh, a Tibetan term for a subgroup of monks from a specific monastery who focus on one field of Buddhist knowledge. While such subgroups are common, the dedication of individual buildings for the purpose of specialized study is less so. Um, so at this point, I'd like to con conclude uh, my talk by saying what I'm trying to do is establish this Buddhist space as I was just talking about but connected to a mass of monasteries from, say, uh, ideally the, the 14th century onwards, but really most of them were made in the 1980s to replicate earlier monasteries. There are a few um, buildings that can be dated to earlier periods, um, and I'll uh, show those. So uh, at this point, I'm done with the body of my talk, and I just want to show you some pictures. Um, this is... Um, the main hall of Shachung Monastery and the Dratsang is over to the left a bit. Um, this is one of the major monasteries of the region, probably the biggest Gelukpa, the most important Gelukpa monastery um, in the region of Amdo. It's uh, Labrang, and I would have loved to, given a, to have given a presentation on the mural and tanka program inside this Dratsang because it's related to the topic of my thesis, but um, taking pictures inside is disallowed by the monks and they are there are well it wasn't really disallowed uh, there's just a, a, a there's a story about it I came into this monastery to do field work and I was initially accepted by all the monks and they were allowing me to spend some time inside and record all of the the murals but all monasteries most of the major monasteries in China uh, have cameras in them and they're connected to a range of officials uh, from the monastery up to the government so as I continued my field research um, the, uh, the monks uh, explicitly told me that I was no longer allowed to do uh, extensive research inside the monastery. I could not stand inside the monastery for more than uh, like a second or two, and I could not take notes inside the monastery. Um, so I, I just kind of, um, I, I do want to write about this uh, monastery, but I will probably resort to, resort to illustrations, uh, probably taking into account my graphic design skills that uh, Pat had complimented earlier. This is the kind of thing that we can see inside the monastery. This would have, something like this would have been seen on the front walls um, as you enter into the monastery. And of course, you have a genealogical series, we can call it that, of reincarnated um, um, kings uh, inside the Kalachakra monastery, in, inside the Kalachakra Dratsang, uh, and in other Dratsang um, that seem to replicate the kind of passage of time that I was talking about in terms of the thousand Buddhas and other repeated images where in, when you see them you essentially see the entire history of the person in this uh, series. Uh, this is one of the older monasteries, uh, extant buildings um, in the region of Amdo. Uh, Niantok Monastery was uh, made in 1684, and this architectural is, architecture is most likely from 1684. The most interesting thing about this monastery, though, is that it was covered in plaster during the middle part of the 20th century, so that um, after, in the 80s or so, they peeled off this uh, plaster mud and revealed a full set of murals on the inside of the monastery, which allows it to be, um, say, comparanda or um, a, a a source, a node, from which to compare the, the, the paintings inside um, the Dratsang that I was looking at and um, other sites in the area. 
Uh, this is just a, to kind of orient you. Uh, this is a more popular, I mean, uh, newer monastery, more, more highly decorated monastery. But this is what the inside of some of, what some of the buildings look like. Um, this is an important uh, site, another important site uh, in uh, Qinghai. It's the birthplace of uh, Tsongkhapa, the person I mentioned earlier. Um, but what's important about this monastery is that the, the, the name of the monastery means the, like, the million, uh, I thought it was 100,000 or million, uh, the million Buddhas. And we get this concept of a repeated Buddha or a numerical amount of Buddhas um, as inherent in the monastery and certain sites themselves. Um, I think I want to finish with this image, which is an image of a clock in what I think was a Kala Chakra Hall. What I want to say was a Kala Chakra Hall. Uh, that has since been renovated into a painting academy. Um, and the work of my dissertation will be to, to kind of relate the themes of time and the calculation of time to um, what's happening at these monasteries today. Essentially, you have on the right a water clock where a, a kind of bucket was attached to one end of it, and it powered uh, this, this clock in this uh, monastery way deep in the uh, mountains of Gansu. Um, this is uh, another Dratsang that I could not take pictures of, uh, but featured the thousand Buddha motif at the third uh, upper level of the monastery, uh, and so presents a continu continuity um, that I would like to talk more about. Uh, and this is just a nice picture to end my presentation with. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a couple of minutes if anybody has questions for John. Oh, I'll go in the back. Right. Uh, a friend of mine has painted somewhat in this style. I have a name of Paul Lafley, L A F O L E Y, and I described his art as cosmic, psychedelic, visionary art. Totally. Any civilization, the civilization, the essence itself made manifest. I, I think I've seen his paintings. I believe, yes, but a visionary uh, art, and I think there, I mean, there, there's something to be said for visionary art. It's its own stream. Um, what I'm doing here is like calculation and um, uh, something akin to like, you know, scientific advancement. But they're, they're, both of these things are, are probably happening. Thanks, John. This is a, a really um, um, a productive place to start, I think, a, a way of thinking about how these multiple images are organized. And I was so struck in 257, I mean, we're in a very advanced state of organization there, it seems to me, because you you not only have the grid-like uh, arrangement that in 254 there are actually some names of the Buddhas. Right, right, I didn't that mention that. Yes. Survive, but here you don't have that. Um, but you have that also that diagonal movement, and I'm wondering how much, you know, we've been talking a lot in recent days about this notion of interviewing the idea of how one medium might affect another. And in that kind of logic of where all of the blue lines are moving in the diagonal direction on the red lines, and it's all very ordered, so it's highly organized, seems to follow the logic of a loom to me. You know, so I'm wondering whether there is some way to think about that since the technology of the loom of course, was highly developed at this time already, and certainly capable of the best way to repeat a series of images. You know, once you set the loom up, loom up all you have to do is keep pushing it through. Um, it'll just be kind of an automatic repetition. So that there's some sort of wonderful logic there about multiplication and you know, the problems inherent in, the, in that whole process. It was eight by eight. It was eight by eight. It was an eight by eight, I think. Right. Uh, is that related yeah. to looms? Yeah, eight by eight. So, so 64, 64. <laughs> oh. And so that, that number could be. Yeah. Uh, uh, another thing with that, uh, so the idea about giving time a shape, I really enjoyed that phrase. It was, it was great. Uh, uh, it was a, uh, how, how can I say? Mathematics uh, really needs learning or science. And it's about ordering time. It comes to mean number because 
Remember is going to be the great way to order time. When they go to make almanacs, they take things in, in, in space and they, they abstract it and turn it into logical patterns all over the place. And even when, when it comes to um, um, these great epochs of time, the, the Kalpa and the Maya Kalpa and on, on and on, if you break them down, they'll be in uh, numerical patterns. Like uh, they'll, they'll use Pythagorean string theory and all things like that. It's games inside of games. So it's all totally. <laughs> To learn more about that, uh, yeah, I mean, the, I, I don't really have comments other than I, I intend to think more about um, the the materiality of Loom as it affected uh, people working at, at the period. I, I think um, there was probably an extensive, um, say, cloth um, production and um, um, uh, use of of uh, different textiles in the region that just doesn't survive anymore. So it's probably much more important than we're uh, um, giving account of uh, than, than I'm giving account of in this uh, in my talk. But I, I do need to think more about it uh, and um, study math more. I think as a, as a um, say prior to numeration uh, even. <laughs> I, the, the one little hat, or I don't know if it's a stupor or what it was, that was kind of like the Japanese one that you showed, and it had yeah. Tucker's on and various things in there. I, I don't know anything about it, art history, but is it possible that that's actually a Shisha period? Yeah, yeah it's Just very possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I, so I mean that would account for uh, the mix. The the kind of um, seats of the the main figures seem very Nepalese to me. I think so. I mean obviously these are like cosmopolitan sites, and there's a lot of different people. But yeah, um, there that that would explain I think the the, the Chinese and the uh, say Tibetan Nepalese mix. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and then uh, just a, an observation that I I really I just have never thought about these diagonal lines before. And normally when I see these paintings with a central figure sort of, I, I think of it as the central figure kind of emerging out of the background of cosmic sort of multiplicity and sort of emanating forth and then withdrawing back into it. And this is the first time that I thought, and I think, I mean, I see the sort of timeless aspect of this, these thousand Buddhas, but you were also saying that there's time in there. Um, and if I understood you right, it's partly because of these, the movement of these diagonal lines that give it a more temporal feel. I mean, if you just have the flat screen of all the same Buddhas, it's a little more timeless than the sense of a movement. And it's just, and this is maybe far-fetched, but it occurred to me for the first time that maybe the direction is not from the Buddha, from all the thousand Buddhas to the emanated single Buddha, but rather the opposite, because of the way you hear about it throughout the tantric stuff and, and sutras, the idea of a Buddha sort of giving off light rays of Buddha that are filled with Buddhas that are going off and emanating in various universes and doing their good and then coming back. Sweating them out, right? Yeah, <laughs> so it's it's just the total opposite directionality than I've ever particularly thought of before. I I need to read uh, more probably and um, just uh, account for uh, th There's probably different reasons um, that I haven't uh, accounted for yet, but thanks. Yeah, John, thank you for this talk. Um, if I may continue on this vein of the diagonality of the thousand Buddhas, it seems that in addition to the diagonal movement of them going upward or downwards, at least in my eye, because of the way you're showing the entire wall together, there's a movement of, there's an actual shimmering movement to it that I think adds depth to what would otherwise be a planar flat. Yeah, related to what Jake was saying about yeah. Uh, waves. Yeah, that definitely like it seems like there's a wave there, which then may relate to the comment about textiles that of uh, something being woven in that move. Um, that's just the comment, I guess. My my question relates to the, the monasteries you're showing at the very end. Um, I'm just curious because this is an area I don't know that much about, but as you know, I'm interested in the idea of like reconstruction. Yeah. What has happened here where the monasteries have been destroyed and then now are being reconstructed in the 1980s? Oh yeah, just uh, communist party party policy. I think of um, you know the ideological 
uh, backwardness and uh, harm that um, belief in Buddhism are, are doing and their uh, removal. I think that the sense in, say, the mid-20th century is that Tibetans were being enslaved by Buddhism and thus needed to be liberated by the utter annihilation of, um, say, a Buddhist thought, which includes um, objects, uh, monasteries, that kind of thing, the actual monks. Monks became, um, I'm, I'm sure there was some violence, but um, they were not no longer monks. They're no longer seen, seen as monks. So um, that starts about 1958, I, I believe. Um, Actual violence, but I mean it's it's part of the the ideolo ideology, and then um, in the later period, there's there's obviously the, the opening up in the 80s. Oh uh, yes, you know, sure. Very interesting presentation. I uh, want to ask one thing. Uh, you show us this larger type of mandala, both in um, painting and uh, the art. I think this is a Vajradhatu, um, uh, but... It shows that the edge of mandala, there is a <coughs> thousand Buddha. You say it's a thousand Buddha. I think, yeah. Yes. I haven't seen this pattern before, as of the mandala. Do you see these, except the STTS, uh, the Vajradhatu mandala, to the uh, yeah, I think they're they're all pretty early. And by early, I mean like um, 13, 1400s. But you get uh, I've seen um, Virochana uh, mandalas just surrounded by Buddhas. Um, not many of them, uh, but um, usually it's Vir Virochana uh, specifically. Um, but there there isn't much of a rec record. Uh, I don't think there's much of a record. Um, Fort Tonka is from like 13, 1400. It really shifts to, to like uh, in the Yuan Dynasty and, and Dunhuang to like Chakrasamvara and, and um, that kind of thing. Um, so um, they're, they're not very common, I think. Could it be just, uh, just as a model, maybe, maybe that's not the Thousand Buddhas, maybe it's, I, I can't remember exactly, but I think right in the beginning of the STTS with the opening narrative that sets the scene for this mandala to emerge, um, I think they talk about all these countless yeah. Buddhas packed into a sesame seed or a mustard seed. Like all, that, all the Buddhas ever. And then so um, it comes out of that, so it could be referencing that. I think I'm, I'm getting it from a commentary on the STTS where somebody says these are the Buddhas of the, this uh, Kalpa and there are, th there are 3,000 Buddhas of the previous, uh, the, the, uh, the prior, the current, and, and future Kalpas. Um, but that's one commentary and there are probably other, maybe there are other interpretations. Um, I think, um, what I should probably do is just count the Buddhas in uh, each of these uh, giant or, or very complicated. Or maybe bring Brian into this mathematics. Yeah. <laughs> it's a program, some kind of um, app or something to count these things. But I, I, I don't see them being like, I, I, they, they, they should be around a, a thousand, I think, uh, or somewhere near a thousand, if not three thousand. I mean, there's, there's, it's this ring here. You can kind of guess how many there are. Uh, is this sutra from which the thousand Buddhas come uh, uh, considered to be of uh, Indian origin or Central Asian origin or Chinese origin or what? I'm not really sure, but I think the uh, I'm assuming that it came from South Asian origin. Uh, and was translated, uh, passed through the, the um, uh, uh, Dharma Raksha uh, and went into Dunhuang. Now, Dharma Raksha is Kushana, but I, I think he was working from S Sanskrit. But I, I really need to uh, do some research and get back to you on that because I'm not sure. I don't know if anybody else knows. In, in that case, is there any Indian depiction of Yeah, there, there's a, a Janta, um, was, uh, kind of way back. Ajanta, again, is dated to 478, but there, there isn't much apart from that one cave in Ajanta. I don't really remember where it is. Did I pass it? I passed it. <laughs> this one. Um, we're 
there, there are different, I think, interpretations of what this is. They all have different mudras, or they, I, I haven't exactly counted uh, how much the mudras vary, but I mean, we can see that there aren't very clear, di I don't think there are clear diagonals uh, in the same sense of the, the other ones. Um, so there's no clear text textual reference that, that this is the thousand Buddhas. It would require intensive site-based research to figure out maybe how many Buddhas there are, if any of them are marked in different ways. Uh, maybe a closer reading of the text to identify what mu mudras or uh, what each of the mudras of the figures means. Uh, so, I mean, I'm claiming that this is um, related to the Bhadra Kalpika Sutra because of Walter Spink, I, I think. And he, he just, he doesn't really have proof of it himself, I think. But uh, the, um, the Kizil Caves um, seem to be from different, seem to have different sutras uh, represented on each of uh, their instantiations of Buddhas. At least that's what I think I got from uh, Monica Zinn's talk, who was here uh, a few week, weeks ago. So it, it, that one's maybe not the Vajrakalpika Sutra, and this might not be as well. Thank you, John, for the fascinating talk. Um, I'm also struck by the diag diagonal lines of the Thousand Buddha motif. And um, I'm realizing that this um, pattern really relies on kind of a flat surface and a controlled um, kind of flatness. But then you showed us this really interesting example where the, I'm already spacing on the exact name of the uh, site. Tendig is, is uh, not intuitive, I think. On this fragment, they're kind of going along with the geological formation yeah, that's at pretty a far more down organic there. and in a more organic way. Um, and uh, so I think I'm thinking could... about um, if you see kind of controlling the space, yeah, this one, um, if you see um, variation like this in other sites and how um, kind of the loss or the slippage of that control, the flat plane of the organized line, um, if that plays a factor at all, or if you see mostly controlled spaces. In Maiji Shan, which is also on the Silk Road, not close to a capital, and probably Yungang, because I don't really know Yungang that well, um, the Buddhas uh, are um, carved into uh, a cave space, but they follow the curves of the uh, interior design of the space. So they, they, like, they curve along with it. Um, this kind of adaptation to natural forms, I think, is probably more of a Tibetan thing. Um, and it, I haven't seen necessarily the thousand or myriad Buddha form um, at other sites in this manner, but I mean, there are uh, like the, um, the Omani Pemiham and things like that adapted to rocks and uh, natural landscapes um, that don't have to, don't necessarily have to flatten things out. So um, this seems, um, yeah, I haven't really seen anything like this. If anybody else has seen this around, I'd love to hear about it. Um, the cave that you showed from Big Lake, the very early cave. Oh, there. Right, right. That's that's disappeared. But I mean, it does retain this kind of lumpiness, yeah, right? Yeah, and they maintain the shape of the cave, but they organized it to a certain extent. They haven't flattened it out, but they smoothed it out so that you could actually put pigment on it and yep. it wouldn't fall off. Right? Just that stucco uh, facing. Yeah, and it doesn't look like there are Buddhas on like the underside of the the cliff. I mean, I I, I didn't actually visit. This is one one of the sites that was kind of close to me, but I didn't visit. Um, so maybe they're um, intending a certain viewpoint from which to look at this so that they might seem flat. Um, so I'll conjecture yeah, I'm, just, I'm also just wondering whether part of the equation is understanding how artisans work. Right, and yeah. And in Dunhuang, you have stenciled, I mean, we're clear that they right. are stenciled thousands the, uh, motifs. The way you can produce them, um, may also have something to do with uh, 
ultimately their the shape compared to some of the places where they probably would have drawn them or rather to paint them individually into the cave. That's a, a great point. I think that you do see some um, change over time because I don't think the stencils really come in until like the, the, the song or later, later period. Um, talking actually. Oh, I thought, okay. They're certainly doing stamping. stamping. Well, then the stamping. You know, I was just thinking of Sarah Fraser's work on Dunhuang and on um, Dunhuang, the Dunhuang Cave, and Dunhuang Cave is really a I definitely would like to yeah, at least, you know, part of sort of thinking about looking more techniques. I mean, there's there's this uh, issue of strings, and I think for some of the earlier straight lines on some of the caves, they they, they are using a string to just initially make the um, the the, the um, horizontal axes, uh, but then the rest of the, the Buddha forms are brushed in. Um, I mean, the, the string thing is is. Uh, has a continuity with uh, Tonka painting, right? And uh, there, there are a few other techniques that overlap that I, I would like to get into for my dissertation. All right, one last, I guess one last question. <laughs> as, as a less, uh, thank you, John, for the beautiful talk. Thanks. As a less advanced graduate student, um, <laughs> and, and knowing a, lot, uh, a little bit about lots, I was thinking about this imagery here on um, this geology. Um, I was thinking about how in, uh, it images work in Mesoamerica and also about images in Southeast Asia in terms of uh, Darshan. So if the idea, maybe we can reverse, instead of how the viewer sees the images, perhaps the images work in a different way so that having them face down is part of uh, the, the existence or, or the presence of the, the image on the, on the surface. That's just a passing thought. Uh, face down, I didn't get. Well, that. you said you you said there weren't any Buddhas on the on the underside. Oh, oh, oh right, right, right. No, okay. They, you, so they they can look out. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a visual point I get it. Of perspective to look at the images. Right. But sometimes we know that images look at us. Right. Right. And so the interaction is not us seeing, but being sort of en encompassed, engaged by the surface. No, that's a, an important point, and I mean, I was trying as best I could in the uh, in, in my research not to privilege the person looking at the Buddhas, even though I reverted it to, reverted to that kind of um, statement once in a while. But I mean, I, I there are there, there as, as you pointed out with Darshan, there there's a, a two-way looking process, and I just didn't want to move <laughs> into that uh, very closely. But there is all, the the case gets more complicated if we take into account the viewpoint of the Buddha and the viewpoint of the, the um, supplicant or worshiper. Um, but you know, some more to think about. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, John. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Um, and hope to see you next time.